Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Data Standard Audio Experience. Today we have Alex Freed, the Director of Data and Computational Science at Flybits. And today we're going to be speaking about the big topic of machine learning on encrypted data. So welcome to the show, Alex. I'm excited to speak with you and learn more about your journey. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. And um, I, let's just get started. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. So. Uh... As you said, I'm Alex Freed, uh, and I've been doing data science now for about six years. And before that, I was in academia. I finished up uh, my PhD in physics at Stanford University, and uh, I got really interested in the whole data science uh, field. So I've been in the private sector now, and I've had the, the opportunity to wear a whole bunch of different hats, both in terms of doing data analysis and machine learning, as well as some of the more engineering aspects and also some of the management aspects as well. So it's been fun. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And so I know today we're talking more about machine learning on encrypted data. So can you tell the audience more about what encrypted data is? Yeah, yeah. So encrypted data is uh, exactly that. You have data and it's encrypted. And then the question is, can you do processing on that? And uh, one of the things that you're finding more and more these days is uh, companies want to share data with each other. They want to use other companies' data. And the issue there is that this data has lots of private information associated with it. And so if a company is trying to uh, build a product or do an analysis with another company's data, they run into this issue where they run up against uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, they may not be able to, to, to use the data because uh, one of the, the, the companies is afraid of it being leaked. That's where encrypted data can come in handy. So regarding the, the leaking uh, of data, there are certain fields in particular that are dangerous uh, if they are leaked. So this, this is called personally identifiable information. That includes your name, credit card number, location, things like that. So if that's directly leaked inadvertently or uh, intentionally, that's that can be illegal. And so companies definitely want to prevent that. And then the other thing is a little bit more insidious, which is that if that data is leaked, uh, maybe that data does not have any uh, PII information associated with it but it could be used in conjunction with another data set. Together, you will be able to identify PII information. So a simple example would be, uh, you have a private data set where you have one column which has your credit card number and another column is information about whether a medical procedure has been performed. I've per uh, a certain credit card was used to purchase a medical procedure. And so if that is leaked, accidentally, another party could take that data and cross-reference it with another data set that has our credit card numbers and actual names associated with it, and therefore back out who's actually received the medical uh, treatment. And that, that's a major breach in trust. And that's something that the companies are actively trying to prevent. And so encrypted data comes to the rescue in that way they can transmit the information in a safe way. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. Um, and I know that machine learning must be a huge part of your role, what you do. And so how does machine learning really impact encrypted data? Or how does it kind of relate to this? Yeah. So oftentimes the companies just want to use this information for statistical purposes. Uh, they don't really care about actual individual level information. They just want to, to get correlations and uh, build machine learning algorithms. And so there are techniques, there are encryption techniques out there that allow you to obfuscate personal information, but still allow that statistical information to be provided. So this is an active field of research. It's been going on for decades now, but it's still in its infancy in terms of actually building real applications with it. You'll find lots of libraries that are available, Co a couple companies out there that are trying to get into the space uh, and we'll see where they go. And uh, you also see it's employed in some of the more larger organizations. So like the, the 2020 census, this is the, the first year that they used certain techniques for protecting data, encrypted data or uh, blurred data when calculating demographics. Uh, so 
you know, the census, as you know, it's about counting uh, how many people are in the nation, how many people are in each state and di district, etc. So that has specific purposes for voting, deciding how many representatives are there. But other uh, organizations in the government would also like to have access to that data. And so allowing that data to be released to a whole bunch of other organizations is uh, a high priority for uh, the census. And so they start using these encrypted data techniques to prepare uh, their data and then to eventually release it. You also see it now in some of the big companies like Apple and Facebook. So they are collecting lots of data from your cell phones, and that's not very comfortable for a lot of people. And so what they're doing is they're using some of these techniques as well to anonymize the information, but still retaining the statistical properties of that data. And so they can collect it and build their, their product enhancements with it, but still they won't know what an individual person said. And then lastly, you can also use machine learning to attack uh, uh, encrypted data as well. So if you know, uh, if you have an encrypted data set or you have a data set that is, uh, has fields that are uh, unlabeled and you want to identify what a certain column in a data set actually is, you can use machine learning or statistical techniques to uh, identify what exactly is in that data set. So if you know that the average is uh, a certain number, you can check the average of each of these columns and find out which column has the average that you expect it to, to have and therefore identify what it is. Yeah, no, that's awesome to hear how other companies are also kind of utilizing this encrypted data within um, the things they're working on with machine learning. So that's great. And um, could you give us either a general example or an experience that you've um, kind of worked with that kind of dealt with machine learning on encrypted data? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So there are a lot of things, a lot of protocols out there that utilize this. The, they, the protocols go under a lot of different names. Uh, so you can look at them up. Federated learning is an example. Uh, Multi-party uh, co computing is another. Split learning. So they have lots of different names, but they all tend to use uh, very similar elements. So I'll, I'm going to talk about a couple of them. Uh, and I'll, I guess I'll also talk about some of the things that I've done. Uh, so one of the, the key components of these algorithms is called differential privacy. And differential privacy is, is kind of straightforward. You just, you have data and you add noise to it, uh, random noise. And when you add that, that, that noise, you have hidden that, that the data from the, the, the personal information in that data, but you still are able to retain the statistical information because when you average over that, that noised data, the noise goes away. Uh, and the more data that you have, the more that noise will uh, disappear and the key statistical behaviors will go away. So an example would be, you have a list of age information from phones say, and you want to calculate the average of that. Um, well, you can add just random noise to the uh, those ages, and that won't affect the average if you have enough data. And you you can see how there's this nice trade-off where if you're adding more noise, the only way in order to recover the same amount of the the actual mean of the data with better precision is just to add more data, and that's not a bad trade-off. Yeah, in summary, that idea is that you're obfuscating uh, the data with randomness, but you, you recover the data, the statistics through aggregation. So that's one ingredient that's really cool. And then um, an another ingredient that uh, people tend to use is something called homomorphic encryption. And so there you have your data, you encrypt the data, and then you do some sort of computation on that data. And you th the result of which will be still encrypted. So keep in mind when you're doing encryption, you're converting numbers into numbers. And so you can still do the same operations that you did, that you would do on the unencrypted data as you would on the encrypted data. And so the, the funny thing about these techniques, these homomorphic techniques is that once you decrypt the data after it has been computed with, you will get exactly the same result as if you had fed in the encryption 
or the, the, the data into the calculation without having done the encryption itself. So the simple example is you have two numbers, you want to securely add them. So you, you, you take each one, you encrypt each one, you add the two together and the, the two encrypted numbers together, and then you can decrypt them and you will get the same, uh, the, the solution to that will be exactly what it would have been if you had added those two numbers without encryption. You can also do the same thing with scalar multiplication. You, add, you encrypt uh, a number and then you multiply it by an unencrypted number. Uh, you can recover what the solution was. And so th that's a pretty cool thing. And there are a lot of algorithms that are well known, uh, like RSA or Palier, they've been around for decades now and uh, they can support that type of operation. I guess the, the other thing that's cool is that those two operations, addition and scalar multiplication, form the basis of linear algebra. So if you have those uh, all of linear algebra at your disposal, any operation or computation you wanna do with those two components, you can do the, the, this homomorphic encryption with. And uh, in machine learning, it turns out that you're doing a lot of linear algebra. Uh, and so you can use things not only to use this homomorphic encryption to not only calculate things like averages, but more sophisticated averages like regressions, or uh, if you can't do uh, like a full log logistic regression, you can do uh, gradient descent on it. And so in there, it's a little bit more complicated because you'll have to have a more sophisticated route for sending data back and forth Earth between your two partners who have uh, who you want to share the data between, but it, it, it's getting better, and there are a whole a lot of games you can play just by using linear algebra. Yeah, definitely, and yeah, linear algebra is um, very important, especially in machine learning. There's a lot of different things that you could be using with it, definitely. And we know that just data encryption in general and machine learning in general, it's a big topic that will be changing throughout um, the next decade and the years to come. And technology is always going to be advancing. So how do you see this field advancing in the future? And how do you see it kind of changing in the future? Yeah, yeah. So I was just talking about linear algebra. So there's a, an, another type of homomorphic encryption, fully homomorphic encryption. It was discovered a little over 10 years ago where you, not only do you have addition and scalar multiplication, but you also have just ordinary multiplication between two encrypted numbers. So that means that by composing those three operations, you can construct any polynomial and technically any computable function at all. So it's it would be possible to do anything you want with encrypted data and then send the results of that computation back uh, to whomever and they can decrypt it. But the problem with that is that the techniques that they have today require um, ciphertexts, that's the data after it has been encrypted, to be incredibly long. So it takes a lot of computing power to, to, to process uh, the data. It takes a lot of uh, computing power to encrypt it. And it's not always feasible to do that when you have a lot of data. And so there, the techniques there, I, I, I see that there will be improvements both on the algorithmic side, as well as on the hardware side, where they'll just have specialized hardware dedicated to performing these types of encryption tasks. I think uh, more important though, is on the cultural side. So right now we have a lot of heterogeneity in the technical infrastructure of a lot of companies. So some companies want to share data with each other, but they may not have a lot of technical infrastructure already. Other companies will have invested a lot in engineering infrastructure and will be able to support things like this encryption. And right now, when you have those two sets of companies forming partnerships, it's uh, because it's so one-sided, it ends up being uh, very difficult to deploy these types of techniques uh, because it requires computation on both the sending and receiving side. But I anticipate that uh, companies, uh, you know, as, as the industry grows, more and more companies will have the ability to uh, deploy these types of systems. The second thing there, it's kind of cultural, is this is a relatively new field. Uh, so companies are, are not necessarily trusting of these techniques. 
uh, and they haven't invested a lot of time in, in putting together policies for sending, for what data can be sent out what data absolutely needs to be fully encrypted versus what data can be encrypted, but still leak the statistical information. And because that's not in place, companies tend to have a very uh, strict approach, which is that you can't play any of these games with encryption. You have to encrypt everything or we won't do this at all. Uh, once, once that hurdle is surmounted and people are more comfortable with uh, you will have more of an opportunity to use all the techniques that people are inventing to transmit data. And then lastly, the nature of these algorithms is that there's no like one solution that will cover all the different cases. You have to have a customized algorithm or protocol uh, for each specific application. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what I suspect you'll see is that the actual use cases uh, and protocols that will become more and more uh, useful will tend to gravitate towards a couple different uh, paradigms. And so that could include not just algorithmic paradigms, but data transmission paradigms. So uh, the, the, the schemas of what data and how data would be sent between organizations would become more and more standardized. Yeah, no, that sounds great how um, it'll definitely be advancing in the future, given all of the technology that's changing in the future. And so thank you so much for sharing your perspective on that, for sure. And um, I wanted to say thank you so much, Alex, for joining us on the show today. It was such a pleasure to have you here today. Um, where can everybody find you online to connect with you? Uh, probably the best place is my LinkedIn account. So. Alexander Freed, based in Virginia. Uh, just look me up and I'll, uh, I'll see your message. Yeah, sounds great. And um, to our audience, for more information on the data standard, you can find us at www.datastandard.io, as well as our LinkedIn and YouTube channel. So thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. Such a pleasure to have you and hope to talk to you again soon. Great. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.